We're going to take a very brief look at some visual trickery techniques used in the film industry over the years. I suppose we have to recognise that all film is visual trickery, in that the images are not moving at all. It's just our persistence of vision tricking our own brain into believing that we are seeing movement. And this can be demonstrated by a simple flick book. The film version of this dates back to 1878, when Edward Mybridge took a series of photographs of a galloping horse. He used multiple cameras, each one being triggered by a tripwire. When they're viewed in quick succession, it gives the impression of movement. In 1895, the Lumiere brothers gave us one of the first true cine films, showing Paris in 1895. This would have been remarkable at the time, and actually still is today. This recorded exactly what the camera saw, so it was actually visual reality. But this is about visual trickery, and it didn't take long to make the leap. Just three years later, George Mellet, a French magician and illusionist, used multiple exposures of the same film with masking to create one of the first special effects in his film Four Heads Are Better Than One. This was achieved by multiple exposures of the same film by rewinding to the start and using a black mat, masking out different parts on each exposure. Soon, moving film was accepted as normal, so film producers had to create drama films to hold viewers' attention and keep them buying tickets at the picture houses. In 1903, Edwin Stanton Porter made The Great Train Robbery. He wanted to show the inside of a train station with a train passing by the window, and due to the amount of light that was needed for the interiors, it was impossible to balance it with the daylight from outside. His solution took inspiration from George Mellet. He filmed the interior shots masking out the window, then filmed the train masking out the interior to create a double exposure. Something my grandfather did with stills. He photographed himself watching himself having a bath. This is similar to split screening, where one sequence of film is overlaid with another, showing half of one image and half of another. And this was used to great effect in Peter Hinner's film, The Hat. Back to 1918. Frank Williams came up with an ingenious method that used travelling mats that could move around in the frame. And one of the best examples of this was the 1933 film, The Invisible Man. First, the actors were filmed in front of a black background, which was repeatedly reprinted onto high-contrast film until a mat was achieved. This showed a black silhouette over a completely white background. This was inverted to make the cover mat with a black background and a white foreground. Yes, it all gets very complicated, but after many more steps, it was processed to make the final film. However... Due to the number of processes involved, the picture quality was degraded and it generated a noticeable halo effect. The 1933 film King Kong was the first film to use the complicated dunning process invented in 1925. It involved lighting the background with blue light and the subject in yellow light. Once again, it was a complicated process and could only work with black and white film, so it died out with the advent of colour movies. In 1940, Larry Butler gained best special effects with The Thief of Baghdad, another complicated process that needed several passes of the film, then combining it all in a special optical print. This was thought to be the forerunner of blue screen or chroma keying, but in its infancy it could not deal effectively with fine details such as hair or smoke. Moving on, producers looked for ways to film a scene and make it grander or add in elements that were not available on location. They came up with a glass shot, which has been attributed to Norman Dawn. A piece of glass would be placed between the camera and the scene being filmed. Then, by painting on the glass, it had the effect of obscuring the real scene and replacing it with whatever they wanted. They used this technique for the 1935 film The Last Days of Pompeii, was also used extensively in the 1959 film Ben-Hur. Whilst this method solved one problem, it created another in that the camera had to be locked off. If the camera or glass print moved, the registration would be out and it would spoil the illusion. 
Disney used the sodium vapour process invented by Petro Vahus. It used a white background lit by sodium vapour lamps, the sort that used to light our streets. Because it used a very narrow spectrum of light, it could be filtered out with a specially coated prism creating a travelling mat. And probably one of the most famous examples of this would be from Mary Poppins. There was only one of these prisms ever made and Disney did not allow its use on the cheap. With the advancement in cinematography now using digital processes, we have the development of chroma keying using blue or green screen backgrounds. Green has become the standard as it's easier to key out as digital sensors have twice as many green cells than blue. Also, it's the furthest from skin tones, making separation easier. This is the process that we associate with weather forecasters standing in front of a map. Over the years, it's been enhanced, and with the use of tracking dots, movement in subject and camera can be dealt with in post-production, enabling extremely convincing effects. The next generation of visual trickery is the use of LED volumes. In this setup, massive wraparound video walls and sometimes ceilings and floors display the environment which could be real but is generally computer generated. This has the advantage that it's easier for actors to immerse themselves in the story. Also the video wall will naturally be reflected in anything shiny and can also cast a glow on the actors making post-production much easier. However, it's extremely expensive and requires lots of technical skills and knowledge, plus masses of computer power. For the non-professional movie maker, a small green screen and a modest amount of skill can get you started. For LED volumes, you need a huge capital investment or a big budget to rent one. There's no doubt at all that we haven't seen the end of visual trickery in filmmaking. Who knows what will happen in the future? <laughs>